Now, turning to our program, please welcome Joan Nesbitt, Vice Chancellor for Development and Alumni Relations at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to introduce our speaker. Hello, happy Tuesday, happy Rotary Day. I have to put my glasses on. I am pleased to introduce Matthew Jarris, professor at UWM School of Architecture and Urban Planning. Matt is best known for his architectural design work related to historic preservation. So by com combining his teaching and research with his involvement in community preservation activities, he has provided extensive opportunities for students to apply and expand their academic learning. He has a private practice, MTJ Architects, and through that he has offered students important hands-on education in the matter of professional preservation projects. He serves on a number of boards, local preservation boards and uh, commissions, but impressively he also serves as the Midwest Advisor to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This places him at the forefront of the latest developments and challenges in preservation at the national level. Additionally, he serves as a director of the Wisconsin Trust for Historic Preservation, a statewide organization that serves um, to provide collaboration opportunities for students in the architecture and urban planning program. So today, he's going to share stories of local preservation efforts, some that have worked, some that have not, but all of which have played a role in creating the architectural landscape of our beloved city. So please let us, let us give a warm rotary welcome to Matt Jarris. Hey, Joan, thank you very much for that. Hello, everybody. Uh, I really want to kind of thank the group who put this together. I'm a preservationist, I'm an architect, but I look for any opportunity to talk about great architecture and some of the great uh, uh, gems that we have here in Milwaukee. I, what wasn't mentioned, I, I don't know who does, I guess I did those things, but when you do something for 30, 40 years, I guess you have that kind of long list of stuff. But Another thing I have at UWM is uh, I direct uh, three different field operations, one in Japan, one in Italy, St. Germany, Italy, and, uh, and one in Germany. Uh, Germany has been our latest, uh, Frankfurt University of Applied Science. We're working with them. So I have a, a bit of a record um, in, in, as we said, in kind of understanding the nature of historic preservation. You've read some of the things up there. I think probably the most important thing that you can see on that is the very lowest thing in the water. Uh, my house is 1899. Anybody who has a house wherein the age starts with a one and an eight, you know what I've done with my free time for the last 30 years or so. A labor of love for sure. Um, I, I was asked to do this and, and there are so many great things I wanna talk about. Uh, I know when I talk in Japan, uh, to some of the universities there, um, I do four-hour lectures, but they're nice in Japan because they give the students a break at the two-hour mark. So I said, do you want the four-hour lecture? We'll do the 30-minute lecture here today. So there are a lot of slides that I'm going to be showing. I'm going to be going through them very quickly. Uh, we think the slide projector works. We tried it out. I think it'll work. Um, and, and I guess my question when I was putting it together is, shall I do a lecture on historic preservation success stories or historic preservation failures? Success is great, but as we all know, you learn a lot from the failures, quite frankly. So we're going to see a little bit of both of those in the, uh, in the next 30 minutes. The other thing I was going to say is this is kind of, I'm, I'm used to teaching students. We had a couple hour lecture this morning with the uh, National Park Service director from Omaha, Nebraska. These tend to be interactive things, question and answer things. So 
you're going to be given some questions here as I continue. You don't have to raise your hand, but you have to yell out if you know what buildings these are. Okay, is that clear to everybody? We're going to do it that way. It should be a lot of fun. Let's see if this thing works. Okay, there's the first one. I decided to look back that Preservation Institute that Dean Bob Greenstreet and I created about 25 years ago has collected up a lot of photos and a lot of art, art, uh, artifacts from the past. And what I thought I'd, I'd do is kind of see what that's all about. And the very first project I'm gonna show you is a kind of interesting and unusual one. It's a little bit more about repair work than anything. Um, what I want you to focus on here for a second, if you can, I do have this laser point. See, it kind of works here. Focus on that area right there if you can, okay? Everybody got that? If you can see that, focus on that area. And then take a look at that and read that. The reason I put it up is I found it as I was looking for old photos. So you can see a lot of wonderful old, old photos today, but I, I saw that Bob and I, probably a couple people in this room, put together the workshop way back when. It was at the Hefter Center at the campus. And you can read it, you see what it has to say, 1997. I was uh, appointed by Mayor Northwest to be on the pension in 1993. And uh, Bob Greenstreet and I decided, well, we gotta, there's something that we can do and we can create this kind of institute that can deal with local challenges in Milwaukee. And one of the reasons I put this up here is I'm kind of looking around going, everybody knows the term, the Park East Freeway, I think. But I've had years of students coming in now. Think about college students, 22, 23, 24, 25. They don't know what that term is, the Park East Freeway. So this has moved beyond what our world of let's get rid of that expressway system and make this a real city uh, has become. So it, it was fun to look back on that and, and see what we did to put that together, working with Peter Park and others to make that happen, which leads me to the next site. I, I see John Norquist every now and then. He's down in Chicago. Some of you might see him. He's down there and uh, likes to talk about how Milwaukee was the first city to proactively take down an expressway, which is really cool, pretty important for the city of Milwaukee. Now you've heard of things after that. Remember the World Series uh, in San Francisco in 89, that expressway fell down. You've heard of the big dig and so forth, but we were the first ones to proactively take down an expressway. And I thought it would be fun to show this slide because at one point in time, the expressway was going to encircle the downtown. Okay, you all can read that map. You know where we are. And you can see, and I'm not kidding about this, there's the drawing, and you can look at even the dates. Okay, so we, we did that, constructed that. We remember the Blues Brothers. That's where that edge of that expressway was. And we started coming down and around this way took out all those, right? Everybody knows that that area, took all that stuff down and we were gonna just kind of make it a nice big loop so that back in the 60s and the 70s, you could get the heck out of Dodge and get to your suburb. That was the idea back then. Thankfully, Milwaukee is kind of not quite as, as quick to the draw as other progressive cities like Chicago or Minneapolis. So we never did get the whole thing constructed. When I came here, um, in 89, I grew up in Milwaukee, out south side, Mitchell Street, and came here uh, with my light wife in the late uh, 80s and had lunch with David Kaler. <laughs> I don't see David here now. But we talked about the fact that the art, there were plans for the art museum to be constructed at that location with the expressway running underneath it. There were actually designs for that. We were where we are sitting right now with the art museum. So that's how much, you know, the expressway system and get out of Dodge and what it did to our cities. So we're gonna see what it did to our city in particular, we're not the only city. But we're gonna see a couple examples here, and I wanna see if any of you, any of you know these. So I'm gonna just tell you, because this will give it away, but the location I'm talking about now is right here, okay? Anybody know what that is? What? All right, there it is, I knew someone would, Chris is here for that. That's the Gipfel Union Brewery, okay? And you'll see where it was, but shortly after I got on the commission, coming from the East Coast and coming to the city of beer, 
Uh, and, and the proposal, the request by the owner was to demolish this. Well, we did proper research and said, well, wait a second, this is the city of beer and we're going to take down the oldest existing brewery. 1853 is when the Gipfo was built and put there. And luckily at that point, we did have an ordinance. We did have a commission and, uh, we said, maybe we ought to give it, give it a little bit more thought. Um, and here's some of the old pictures of the Gipfo brewery, uh, came down to us a little deteriorated, but still wasn't bad for a very small building. Wasn't that bad at all. But, and the key thing in a number of the slides you're gonna see is privately owned. Privately owned, right? That's our struggle here. When I take students to Germany, to Japan in particular, it's a kind of a socialistic, you know, they, they have control over some of their public buildings and we look at that. We don't have control over that. It's part of the, the nature of being American, you, you, being an American, being a, you can do what you want with your building. So we've worked very hard, late 80s and the 90s and beyond to kind of work in this sort of private public compromise circumstance. So we did talk with the owners and decided that maybe there can be a compromise for taking this down. Now this kind of predated all of this Pfizer stuff we know about now, but we sort of thought something was gonna happen in that area. So some of you may remember, right? You remember seeing the Gipfel, we took it across the street, moved it across the street behind the Sydney High, right? We all remember Sydney High, that checkerboard building. Would have liked to save the Sydney High building also, but my friend Rocky Marcou and others realized that real estate is a whole lot more valuable when it doesn't have an old building on it. So those things went away also, but it was behind the uh, Sydney High for a couple winters. And when you leave windows open, right, Annette, we know this, you leave windows open, you don't fix drips on, on roofs. I know the house. You, you know, these things deteriorate very quickly. And that's what happened here. And we put the metal straps around it. You can kind of see that. And then finally we got to the point where demolition through neglect was allowable. And so that was taken. But I learned one lesson from that, which all of you should know. And I have friends who have demolition companies don't get me wrong, it's a business, guys gotta make money taking buildings down. But when we, when we gave them then the uh, approval by the commission to de demolish it, I was curious, I wanted to kind of see it as it came down. I liked getting dramatic pictures. You can see a lot of dramatic pictures now in the next 20 minutes. I like seeing that. It's uh, important for me as an instructor, as a teacher, to have archives of this stuff and to, uh, I don't know, let's see what we lost before it's gone, okay? When are you guys taking it down? We're gonna take it down Saturday morning. All right, I drive by on Friday night. It's still there behind. Get up early in the morning. All right, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get some photos. I get there at eight o'clock. It's a pile of stone and brick. Understand for demolition companies, they'll tell you when it's gonna be demoed. They'll demo it three hours before. They don't want photographs on the front of the newspaper. So luckily I had some before it was demoed, but. A lesson I'll never forget, all right? Don't believe the demo contractors. Um, but now we're back to that, because I just want to reference that. But if it, you, like some of you people may have been, the Bucks did so well, we were all out there, but that building would have been right there, okay? And you can see, not we, you know, we like, we're all, everybody's very happy about this, but can you imagine having this original old Gipfel Brewery there, right? The ESPN guys, right? They sit at that table uh, uh, and, and talk about the bucks and all to have have projected to the country. This city cares about its past. It cares about its history. It saved its oldest brewery, a building that is a quarter the size it could have fit in that area right over there. But alas, it didn't come to come come to us, and we didn't make it. All right, next one. What is this? I don't think I quite heard it yet. All right, excellent. Chicago Northwestern Train Depot. And if I'd opened those curtains, you would have seen it. Okay, it's right over there. The next slide will tell you a little bit more. So there it is. And I, this is a funny arrangement. I've got three things I'm looking at, but I'll, I'll do this one. So right here, okay, and we're sitting right in here, looking out those windows at where was the Chicago Northwestern Train Depot. And that was demolished uh, in 1968. You know, all 
city, there's so many tragic stories about great cities losing their great railroad stations, and we certainly did, okay? And, and we lost this. It was a, actually a very beautiful building, kind of Richardsonian Romanesque building, but those magic words, privately owned, okay? There's no way to force them to keep this building, and this was in the late 60s. We had our expressway system up. Uh, you know, you can get out of town so much for passenger rail. So it really didn't need to be, it, it, it really um, didn't have the kind of flow of passengers that it had in the past. And uh, what can you do? You, you know, this is 68, you can't reuse old buildings, right? You, you take them, you get rid of them. And it's, it's hard for us, I think, when we sit at the collectivo and drink, you know, $5 coffee. What do you mean? Of course we can. You know, we've, the decades have shown us that we can be far more respectful and stewards of the past okay, than we were when we were thinking about this in 68. And, and here it is now violently coming down in 1968. I'll remind you all that the Preservation Act was 1966. Penn Station in New York came down in 1968. This whole demo fad finally hit ahead in New York at Grand Central Station. And most of you have probably been to New York Grand Central Station. That was the Supreme Court case that said, yes, in fact, local commissions can prevent and not issue demo permits. But remember, we've lost a lot before that act, before that Supreme Court act uh, was passed and before we really had uh, teeth in, you know, uh, or a bite in architecture uh, uh, preservation. I want to show this. This is really an important photo. Um, the former UWM photographer Alan McGain Roshek, okay, was was one of one of should be one of our heroes in the late '60s, early '70s. Through his photography and through what he was trying to do, is to advance this idea. Folks, we can't lose these great buildings, so he photographed these things. He was a kind of parallel in some ways to Richard Nickel. I'm thinking that doesn't mean anything to any of you, but I'm telling you right now, go Google it a little bit later. Richard Nickel was a very famous photographer in Chicago, and he did what Alan McGain was doing in the 50s and 60s, getting photographs to try to raise awareness and say we can't lose these. Now, some of the buildings he lost and photographed were uh, Louis Sullivan buildings, right? William LeBaron Jenny buildings, uh, Daniel Burnham buildings, these names of architects we know. So he had quite a task. Uh, he died in the late 60s getting photographs of the Chicago Stock Exchange as it was being demoed. Very famous building by Louis Sullivan in Chicago. And he actually died. So it's a dramatic story of a beautiful person through photography trying to, to save great and important heritage landmarks in the city of Chicago. Alan is still around. He's retired from UWM. I'm talking to him almost every other day because he's, he's bringing his archives of all his photographs over to the Institute at UWM so that we'll be able to have this evidence. I use it for, for instructional purposes. Um, that, that's, a, that's a kind of poster that's in my office. Apathy dooms the historic rail station. I'm not going to read that article, but what it essentially says is that, you know, seven people thought it was a great building. Nobody else knew about it, and away it went. Apathy, right? People who don't care, communities that don't care about these great landmark buildings. Luckily, that has changed. And part of our mission at the Preservation Institute is to raise awareness, to get to do the projects that start telling people what we have and all the treasures we have in the city of Milwaukee. I had this, Margaret, I don't know if you came to the show of Less is Less. Did you? You came to this show. So it was at UWM uh, at the architecture building, the photos of Alan McGain Roshek. And we started this kind of PR campaign. Let's get the word out. This still, I think to this day, was the most attended exhibition at our School of Architecture at the outset. The public were invited to see this. And Alan had some beautiful photographs. Less is Less, you kind of know that. It's, it's kind of... Uh, uh, Mies van der Rohe state, less is more. We all know less is more and less is less. <laughs> less is less. And so, so we lost something that Move forward. Ran out of battery or something. Uh, we 
we'll get that. We also uncovered some interior photographs, and that's going to be the next slide. There we go. And UWM, Historic Preservation Institute, is nationally known for the laser scanning documentation work that we do. We lead the way in the country for very sophisticated documentation, which creates three-dimensional electronic files. Okay, some of you kind of know that a little bit. Cornell University comes here to, so we can teach them how to use scanner devices. Okay, we're going to be going to Great Britain the next summer uh, for scanning a castle. I scan in Japan. Uh, we scan, scanning, laser scanning is a way of documenting these things. And you can have them either for archival purposes, I can use them for instruction, you can actually use them to rebuild buildings. These are converted and my students convert these scans into Revit drawings. Some of you kind of know, I know you guys know, into Revit drawings and you can create construction documents from them. It's here in Milwaukee. It's the Historic Preservation Institute. We have it right here. And we can take a, and I don't know about this. My students teach me this, but I had the photos and one of my sharp graduate students said six months ago, oh, well, we can convert that into an electronic file. I said, what are you talking about? I got two pictures in the lobby of the North Chicago North Carolina training depot. Oh no, we have the software to do that. You're kidding me, we can do that. So I have a nice little, Chicago Northwestern train depot 3D print next to my desk. And you can literally make it at any size. So it's, it's exciting. I, I put a slide like this up <clears throat> years ago. I was talking to somebody here about the Betty Brin Museum when I was at Kaler Slater. We worked with Marty Stein to create the Betty, you know, Betty Brin right there. And, um, and it's really ranked as one of the best children's museums in the country. It's a, it's a great museum. Can you imagine it in the Chicago Northwestern train depot, building about the same size? It would be the number one children's museum, certainly in the country. And when I raised my five kids here, I've seen a lot of children's museums around the country. Indianapolis has a great one. None of them have. They're all sort of internally focused. A train station, a tower, Milwaukee, the lakefront, the Calatrava. I mean, this would clearly be the best children's museum had we kept that station. We weren't able to, to keep it, um, but it would have been terrific. All right, next one, anybody? It's a little bit more obscure, this one. Any thoughts? I'll, I'll show you where it was before it was demoed right there. I heard somebody say at the Milwaukee Road Train Depot. Milwaukee Road Train Depot and there it is, uh, also demoed in the late 60s, okay? And another photo that I put up, just for the irony of this whole thing, you guys know what's going on a block west of here, the Milwaukee Power Tool Equipment Headquarters is there. And I say that quite, I don't know, emphatically, when I take, last time I took my students to Japan, we were in some remote Village, there was restoration going on, and sure enough, this Japanese guy had a Milwaukee Sawzall. There it was, on a mountain in Japan. Ah, Milwaukee. Um, but again, can you imagine if this guy was still there, and the Milwaukee Tool Die Corporation had the inside? They already re they're already reusing that other building. I probably have people here from the Milwaukee uh, company power. Use, use the train depot. Would have been nice. Again, this kind of idea that, that there wasn't as much, a lot of bark, but not a lot of bite to the Preservation Act of 1966. The 70s were difficult. We finally had the historic tax credit program in the 80s, and, and things have looked really good since then. Okay, and I provided a lot of advice. And here's another one that, I don't know, you're not a prophet in your hometown kind of thing, is that Wisconsin is looked upon by the best of the by, by the rest of the country as the best historic tax credit operations in the country. Okay, so the National Trust advisors look to it. What are we doing here? Why are we getting this done? How are we doing it? Who are the public officials we've been talking to? How did we get our tax credit raised in 2013 from five percent to twenty percent? How did we do that? So, I have people calling from 
or governmental organizations from around the country asking for advice and consultation on how they can uh, improve their preservation in their states. All right, you've had a chance to look at it. Anybody? Wow, oh, that, that's all of it there. I was going to say Plankington Mansion, but we got Elizabeth and, and another part of the name. So this was uh, really one of our great German Romanesque um, estates on Wisconsin Avenue, 15th in Wisconsin. You'll see the map of it in a second. Um, and I think some of you know the Plankington Mansion. The interesting thing about this now, and Marquette took it down, 1980 it was brought down. But at that point, there was a little bit of kind of a PR campaign to try to save this thing and reuse it. Um, we did issue, or the commission had issued, the city had issued a kind of cease and desist order because they started bashing some of it down. And you can read this in the Journal Sentinel article. It's a fascinating article. They bash it down. They got the stop order. That was on a Friday, right? Have you read that article? On Monday morning when the inspector drove into work, lived in some other part west of the town, it was a pile of stone and brick. Okay? It was demoed that weekend. Now, Marquette suffered a fine for doing that, but that's part of development costs, right? And I don't, I've read the article, I know the article, I don't recall what, uh, what the fine was, but it was so minimal, the fine to take it down. It's just part of your development cost. But again, I put this up, I, I don't want to, I've had two of my five kids went through Marquette University, one is sitting here right now, so I can say what I, what I need to say about Marquette. And we love Marquette. But they went on a very deliberate campaign to discredit the Plankinton Mansion. And I bet she knows about that. Who knows, Elizabeth? And, and this was the way you do things. You get articles, you get perhaps an advising uh, architect to come by and say, no, this is not a good thing. You know, it can go away. I want to read you one paragraph from Father John Donnelly, SJ. You can see him at the bottom there. And it, it says, to offer an example of the Knights of Columbus building is an example of our, as an example of our great architectural tradition will make Milwaukee a laughing stock of the nation. These were the letters to the editor to discredit this thing and discredit, and I, I put those, you know, highlighted a couple of things here, um, and, and below it kind of talks about, but we don't have time to look at more of that article, but, and, and it's, here, here it is, you guys know what this is, but it would have been, you see the laser point, right about there, Right about there. I'm UWM. Cardinal Stritch just closed. Marquette University. We're looking for people, for students. We're, we're looking for students to have a kind of visitor center at Marquette in that great German mansion, taking up little or no room. What a memorable thing for parents. I got to take my kids around and look at these universities. What a memorable thing to be in Milwaukee and to go to a visitor center with a city that respects its past so nicely. So I, I show these just because, not so we, we lost great buildings, but uh, what, what could have been, what could have been. Particularly, uh, particularly with our, our big institutions, there's plenty of, of land at Marquette University to save these things. It's not an issue of, that you would have in Tokyo where I take the students. You don't have four square feet to, to live in in Tokyo. We have plenty of room in Milwaukee. We've got to make decisions about building where we actually don't have, have buildings. This one, I'm sorry, I can only go very quickly. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah, right, B1 of the American Systems Built Homes. Okay, This is a landmark in Milwaukee, again, of the highest order. It's, this is an international landmark. How many of you have been to it? Probably not many. Oh, yes, great. On Burnham Street, you've been through, you've been into B1 and so forth. And uh, it's a long story. We don't have time to hear my long story, but there's six houses, four duplexes, two single family residences. And again, in the 80s, a kind of discrediting campaign went on. Uh, a lot of them had been modified. Actually, the one with vinyl siding, you can see it to the left, uh, is still there with vinyl siding. About half of them are working on restoration, half of them privately owned, six privately owned houses. How do you do that? Uh, but Mike Lillick and the organization have been doing a fabulous job. A lot of you have been out to it. Uh, and our, our heroes are the arenas, 
they worked on it in the, in the late uh, uh, 1980s, brought it back. It's so beautiful and gorgeous. Get down to see Burnham Street, 27th and Burnham if you haven't. Jerob Ortiz is a national photographer. That's that fellow behind that tripod. Okay, there's a national photographer position at the National Park Service. It's called the Ansel Adams National Photographer. Okay, about seven years ago, the person who had that role for 30 years retired. Okay, they interviewed over, and I know my people in DC, they interviewed over 2,000 people from around the world to take this position as a national photographer. That fella got it. His name is Jerob Ortiz. His proposal and submittal to this national board was so moving and so different than everybody else's that he was chosen for it. Jerob went to MATC here in Milwaukee. He spent most of his life in the Menominee Valley taking pictures of our old, rusted industrial heritage. Okay? The board in DC had seen enough of Mount Vernon and the Eiffel Tower and all that. Here was this guy making poetry out of old industrial heritage. He got the position. I had him here a couple of years ago. Some of you may have come to that. I will get him here again. He's very important for the last slide you're going to see today. But Jerob was here. This is four or five years ago, taking photographs of the American systems built homes. Those have to be in the Library of Congress. Okay. The 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 other buildings that we're going to look at here, and you're going to see at the end. The Park Service wants this documentation. They want this, and they contact me. Matt, we're coming. Has anybody taken proper photographs of Mitchell Park domes? No, Jerob, when are you going to come out? We'll get the domes documented properly. We want that at the Library of Congress. So, and, and there's B1 now. Half of you people have been in B1. Next question. It's not a building question. What's How large is B1? Okay, Wright had done a portfolio of these, these systems homes, 28 of them. Thought they'd be built everywhere. World War I, a bunch of other things interceded, they weren't. Okay? But this was a catalog of houses. The perception of Wright is that he has very wealthy clients and does huge, enormous houses. Guess what? That's not entirely true. So he had this. You don't hear much about it, but we have six of these houses on the south side of Milwaukee. This is 856 square feet, two bedroom house. Genius, when you walk through it and the skylights and the light and the flow, you cannot believe that. And uh, you know, we talked to the fellow who owned it, he raised his family there, he just didn't wanna get rid of it. How he integrates the outside with the inside, it's, it's really a, a very important and profound thing. All right, a couple more slides. Can anybody tell me what this is? Anything, anything, anybody? Yeah, I hear a couple pretty pretty good ones. The next slide, I want you to focus on the sheds in the back on the left. I'm not gonna get the laser pointer out. Does that help you a little bit more? See the county stadium, right? County stadium, not Millip, county stadium. And then you see uh, the uh, soldier's home on the hill. All right, now I'll have to intercede with my little talk here to say that there are two preservation projects of the highest order in Milwaukee that are looked on by the rest of the country and beyond. One is the soldier's home, and number two is the Pabst, I'll call the brewery campus. Well, okay, they're in our city, who cares about them? I'm telling you, when I go to Japan, they want me to talk about this. They want to talk about the soldier's home. There's a third one they want me to talk about. Can anybody guess what that would be from the city of Milwaukee? The Harley Davidson. The Harley Davidson Museum, the Harley Davidson, the whole Harley Davidson. So I'm telling you, we have a couple great things in this city, and we take this stuff for granted sometimes, but these are great and important things. Now I have to go through this really quickly, but you see those sheds? Okay, you know where it is, right? All right, anybody see what this is? And I'm going to cut to the chase. This is Comiskey. Comiskey Field in Chicago, south side of Chicago. You can see a little bit in that aerial. And I put it up for this reason. My business partner in Chicago, this is the mid, mid, uh, middle 80s, went to St. Louis to HOK, the designer of that. Said, well, it's an anonymous looking stadium. Okay, fine. But he said to my friend Bob Lynch, he said, 
come down the hall, I want to show you the other thing we're working on. Anybody know what that is? Camden Yards. Unusual, quirky stadium. That warehouse building is rented for four years. You can't get in there. An unusual field. And we all know Camden Yards now. I showed some Chicago people Comiskey. They didn't know that was Comiskey. You could have put it anywhere. You could have put Comiskey anywhere. You could see it anywhere. There's nothing unique about it. And I think about those sheds. And I think about us working with Peter Park, as I did at the time, to try to save those sheds. They're on the parking lot of Miller. Can you imagine that small footprint if those sheds were still there? We had the locomotive. You said the locomotive. Yes, that was the largest. Lo you all read John Curtis's book. The largest locomotive repair operation in the country was happening in our valley. 20,000 people from each side. We were repairing locomotives to have a shed, a memorial in that parking lot, rented out, weddings, all the rest of this stuff. Didn't make it. Didn't make it to us, unfortunately. I'm going to show this one. I'm going to say it quickly. We have the greatest park system. We don't appreciate that, right? And I'll tell you this. I'm not going to go on the long story. But when we were trying to save that little municipal building, we did the research. Milwaukee has more park space it's a couple of years ago per capita, per person, than any city in the country. Who knew this in here? Great. There, they can testify, if you don't believe me. How did that work? Well, that worked because we had a lot of these small municipal, wonderful little buildings, small little buildings, big as this stage, scattered around the county. Most or all of them are gone. You see some around the uh, North uh, Avenue, Reservoir, when you drive around there, there's still a couple left there. And the developer came to us. He was going to build that resident. This is on Humboldt, right by the river. He was going to build that residential right up to the sidewalk, the way it was owned for. We said, hold on a second. We'll give you all that land along the river. We want something about one of these few remaining buildings. So we did it. We saved it. It's still there. The taco joint, you have all had tacos at the Humboldt taco joint. Taco joint, modern architecture, fine. Works fine. Traditional, modern. We don't have to do fakey old stuff. Collectivo, we know the struggle we went through. I, I apologize for talking too much about this stuff, but it really is in my heart. I've worked so hard to keep some of this stuff. You know what this is, the, the United States Coast Guard Station. We all saw it. We all worked so hard to try to keep this place. And I want to tell you something quickly about it. That Coast Guard station is one of the few Prairie Avenue style public buildings out there. Prairie School, we know about that, it's houses, right? We have a great <laughs> Prairie School homeowner here in the audience, but very few public buildings, okay? This is the Coast Guard station. This was a template for Coast Guard stations done around the world. There were many done, all of them gone except for this one and the one in the Philippines. We tried hard for a couple of reasons to keep this thing. We weren't able, you remember that blue tarp on the open roof of this thing? And, and there were a couple winters the tarp was. I went through it. It was a mess. We gave the demo permit and they did it. And you all know what's up there, not even weathering very well. You can almost see it from, from the side. We lost that. A uh, couple more. Boy, if anybody can tell me what this is, I've already asked a couple people. Anybody? Anybody? The street is far well. I'll cut to the chase. It's the, what? Peck Row House. Woman knows all that. The Peck, Peck Row Houses. Okay? Peck Row Houses. Now, this was done by George Peck, and he was a mayor and a governor, okay, turn of the century. Uh, one of the many great row houses that we have. He decided to, to design this and, and have it uh, for his retirement. It fell into disrepair. Okay, and I worked with White Mike D'Amato. We stood in that parking lot when the CVS group came to us and said, "We've got to demo this and expand the parking lot." CVS North Avenue and Far or, uh, uh, Farwell and Brady. You know the location. We said, "Hang on a bit." Now the developer had this. This was six row houses. At the time when he wanted to demo, it turned into a flap house, just individual units. And I can ask you, how many units? Can anybody guess how many units? You won't get it. Sixty-six. 66 units in these row houses. And they were blaming it on the architecture. 
I remember Chuck Engberg was on the commission with me at the time. He was so insulted by blaming this thing and this, this owner, allowing this was a drug house at the time. We were able to save it. It's been restored beautifully. It's, it's back to its six. A lot of that was original, original woodwork and carving. We just cleaned it off. And a lot of you on these, you know this, and that was the pick. Here's when you're gonna see the Prospect Avenue. There's that mansion, Gall Mansion, right? We've all read about this. We've worked for the last 15 years. We're on the third different scheme. A high rise here would be much more profitable. Let's get rid of this mansion. That's the high rise. We worked with them to move this, and I went through, I don't know where we're at, about five, six months ago with Cabal Washotko Company, moving at 37 feet towards Prospect Street Avenue, okay, and putting the high rise behind it. So, you know, my point with some of this stuff is that, uh, you know, compromise, interact, collaboration, you know, we kind of technically, we know how to do this stuff, let's do it. And guess what? At Collectivo, you can charge, what, $5 for a cup of coffee? I mean, these places are, are profitable places. I, I was going to talk about our best Egyptian revival building. Uh, I'm not going to. That'll be in another lecture you have to come to, and we're going to talk about our best. You all know this North Avenue. and, and uh, uh, What I want to do is just do the last two projects. I'm a little bit behind time, but I'll, I'll finish up quickly. But I hope that you enjoy these last two. We probably should turn the lights off in the place to get a better view. This is the awareness campaign that we've been, Green Street and I have been doing at the Institute for 25 years. Raise the awareness on things that are about to be lost and endangered list, excellent, great. An endangered list and, and so on. And I want you to, this laser pointer, but see the thing to the right, you see what that is. That's the Schlitz Brew House, okay? Owned by the Gary, Gary Grunau, Grunau Company. We worked with them for years to try to figure out a way to reuse the Schlitz Brew House. We were unsuccessful, it's been demoed, but that's fine. We had plenty of opportunity to look for possibility. We talked to a lot of people. That's what we want. We don't want to drive in on Monday morning and see the Plankinton Mansion demoed or the Chicago Northwestern demoed. Let's talk about it. We got to get rid of it. We got to get rid of it. But let's meet and let's see who's interested in reusing these things. So the last two fun projects you're going to look at deal with, the, I think in the description, I said where we've been, where we are now, and where we're going. So I'm going to show you two that I hope are kind of where we're going. Reusing industrial past. So important in Milwaukee, right? The industrial past, the heritage of Milwaukee. And uh, this is the swing bridge in, in the river. And I hope you can kind of, it's right over here. Okay. It used to take Journal Sentinel stuff. They don't do that anymore. The circus train, remember the circus and all those, they would come across, they don't come across, it's not used. Canadian Pacific, just soon get rid of it. Anybody about a, got a buck, you can buy it for a buck. So of course the Institute took this on as a challenge and we said, we've got to do something, okay? And so we came up, my star researcher, he just graduated from the Institute, um, did proper droning and scanning. I've told you about the scanning of the Institute. We can do the lighthouses. We can do these things that normally are difficult to document and we can scan them. The scans go inside, that's the bridge, okay? It's in the open position always. Some of you have boats here on the river a lot. Uh, it actually works. The thing works. Let's take it out, get rid of it. How are we going to connect, right? The third ward with the fifth ward, all the development possibilities in the fifth ward. Well, we already have the thing. So we went about a very careful study of converting it, making it a connector, having some original flora and fauna of this area, the tamarack, all that kind of stuff, bands, cafes, make it year round. Okay, that's very important to make these things thermal and year round. And this was exhibited uh, before. You can see some of the cool, there we are on the bridge going around it at night. And I, and I put this up, well, a couple on the last one, but the High Line in New York, right? Remember how ridiculous that, how could you, what? That's the most popular thing in Manhattan right now is the High Line, walking on the High Line. And we really have that potential here. There's our Paps Mansion. This was the, the next one. And we're working now in the pavilion. I think I saw Mame sitting, sitting here. I think she's gone now. But we're going to be working on the Paps Pavilion. And our scanning is going to do the proper documentation. We're going to be disassembling this thing. And uh, there we are scanning. 
and this was a cool one. So we're scanning it with that equipment and we're able then to recreate the proper details. We can fix terracotta and we'll be storing it and taking it down this winter. That says thank you. Um, and that is a huge and enormous and important project. And the only way we got an allowance by the commission and the aldermen to take that thing down is through this high tech state of the art scanning documentation. And so that's what we're gonna work on for the next couple of months and taking that thing down, all of the proper documentation. Someone asked me about the Mitchell Park Domes. Jared Ortiz, we saw him come, he'll be here in a month or so to get proper scanning and photographs of the Mitchell Park Domes before they go away again for archival purposes, for teaching purposes. And if it is ever kept, which I think it probably won't, you can do repair work you know, with this kind of data and documentation. So anyway, there it is. We will definitely have you back for questions though. I, I'm sorry to cut you short. I'm sorry that we won't have Q&A today, but obviously everybody knows we're very we short on time. I think there's sure probably many in. questions. Come back. There's Great. a lot of other jewels in Milwaukee. Great. We'd love it. We'd love it. We'd Thank love you. it. Thank you so much.